Seek enlightenment, for all else will be added on to you. That's kind of one of those sayings we hear a lot. Knock and it shall be open. This is the same idea that as long as you're looking, keep looking, because you'll find it. But find what it is you're looking for. <laughs> so, it's one of those motivational things. So, uh, here we will start off with a quote from Samuel. <laughs> Pretty serious mugshot yeah. there. It's very serious. His driver's license. Maybe it is. <laughs> Enlightenment's. Uh, it seems yeah. Enlightenment's worst enemy is the eye. It is necessary to know that the eye is a knot in the flow of existence, a fatal obstruction in the flow of life. That's one way he puts it, that we can visualize it. Life would run a little more smoothly if we understood our egos or if we didn't work externally controlled by them as much as we are. So that's kind of one of the sayings they use. It's a knot in the flow of existence. Mm -hmm. So, obstacles to the inner work. There are many obstacles facing us on the path to liberation. It can be easy to lose heart and fall off the path. The work of the path is for the few. As Christ said, Out of a thousand who seek me, one finds me. Out of a thousand who find me, one follows me. Out of a thousand who follow me, one is mine. It's just kind of a way to remember that it is for the few. Uh, the greatest obstacle we face is ourself, or rather, our many selves. This is actually a depiction of uh, the Knights Templars seeking the Holy Grail. It's kind of depicting exactly what we're saying. There are a thousand who seek me, only one finds me. You see that there, there are knights falling, trying to find me, and only one is succeeding out of all the ones that are working. So that's kind of an interesting picture. It's an older picture, but yeah. it's from the, uh, the Arthurian uh, Grail legends. The greatest obstacle we face is our many selves. And we, that's something we can verify pretty easily for ourselves. We see that. Mm -hmm. well, what's holding it back? Usually it's ourselves. Usually we talk ourselves out of doing things. Usually we have a great intention of one night maybe to meditate and then, oh, but this came up and that came up. And so this is something that is easily verifiable. Not so much even with meditation, with anything we set out to do. Mm -hmm. When you first set out to do it, it's easy. You're excited about it. You're pumped. You got all this energy reserved for it. And then the longer you continue doing it, whether it's quitting smoking or working out or whatever, it seems to be more difficult, more energy needs to be put in to keep us at the same enthusiasm level. There, what do we have? Oh. The murder of the Grand Master Hiramabeth by the three traitors. This is a picture depicting a Masonic legend of uh, Hiramabeth. Uh, in the Masonic tradition there also exists the three traitors. So this is something Samuel Moore talks about quite a bit, about the three traitors of Hiram. Hiram was like representative of the divine spark, the consciousness or the essence. The three traitors are representative of those three traitors that we've heard about in these lectures. The demon of desire being one of them, represented in the Christian tradition by Judas, because he's one who gives up Jesus for coins, for his desire for wealth. And there's the demon of the mind. In the Christian tradition, that's Pontius Pilate. He's the one who actually crucifies Jesus, but he washes his hands of it because he says, well, they want it done, and I'm just doing <coughs> the law. And the Pharisees said, it. I said, what well, do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? And they said, Barabbas. So, so it's the mind that justifies its actions. And the demon of ill will. In the Christian tradition, it's represented by Caiaphas. The demon of ill will would be the, the most severe. That would mean doing something that we know is wrong, like Caiaphas. He knew that Jesus had an extraordinary teaching, but he sent him out to be crucified, and even though he knew that he was a special <coughs> man, basically. So the demon of ill will is doing something negative that we know is negative, but doing it anyways. This one is one of the more serious ones. Those are the three traitors, three main traitors they say, that keeps the uh, essence enslaved. They can also be thought of as like uh, uncontrolled emotion, destructive action, and negative thought. So action, thought, and emotion used negatively. Can represent, those are representative of the 
the three traders. So it's interesting for us to try and uh, to, to observe this in ourselves, to view it, and to start to eliminate those little egos that maybe manifest from these, but the actual work of eliminating the three traders themselves is a work that's much further on down the path. And the seven-headed beast. It's a, there's many traditions that depict it. The Christian tradition is one, obviously, in the book of Revelations. Uh, the seven, and they represent the seven deadly sins or the seven capital vices, which are wrath, greed, envy, pride, gluttony, sloth, and lust. These would be the main trunks that, that the smaller egos emerge from. The main trunks that these smaller egos most likely have their roots in. But for us, like it's important to understand these, to try and realize how they're working through us throughout a given day, so that we can start to steal the energy from these, so that our consciousness can have it, so that we can gather enough psychic energy to fight these big capital sins, these capital vices, and uh, in, the, in the Christian tradition, that's one that I'm most familiar with. These are the seven deadly sins, but they exist in many traditions, these same seven. It's one of those universal, those universal symbols. I'm going to start with the sophisms of distraction. Here's a fellow opening the door and letting in all these seven deadly sins. Sophisms of distraction. Sophisms are the false reasonings of the subconscious ego which induce us to error. We'll look at, we'll look at the seven uh, deadly sins. So sophisms are the false reasonings, like the justifications, how the, mind, how the mind justifies us portraying these egos through us. So hate, insult, hurt, humiliate others in the name of correcting them for their own good. <laughs> This, is, this, this manifests itself often, and even through us sometimes, and we don't really say, well, I'm not hating, that's not hate, I'm just, you know, but this is how it, this is how it hides. Sometimes it's sophisticated. In this way, many hate without knowing they hate. And uh, anger, the father and mother full of anger whip or discipline the child. This is from a Samuel War book, so maybe they don't whip or discipline the child anymore in our society, but... They still have the same anger. This is done for the child's own good and is accepted as a full fulfillment of parental duty. So, back to hate. We can think that we're, we're, we have the people's best interests in mind, that we're doing it for their own good, but subtly there might be something else that's driving our actions. Or subtly we might not even understand that what we're doing is a manifestation of that. If, if, if we're viewing somebody's actions as incorrect, maybe we have to understand what is it about it that we think is incorrect and do we understand why they're doing it and why are we all of a sudden the judge and the jury and the executioner over what their actions are correct or not. So there, there are ways that we, we present these in daily life without ever thinking that, without ever saying to ourselves, no I don't hate, I didn't do anything hateful today, I didn't say anything mean or spiteful, but might have. And anger, this one is, th th this one definitely exists. It's one of the, the big ones, anger. It manifests in many different ways. Sometimes people, like in a work situation, you're angry at a co-worker or something like that, and they'll ask you to do something, and you'll say, sure. But do you say it like that, or do you go, yeah, sure. <laughs> do you put in your emotion and your vibe to them? Are you, are you, you might not be saying angry words, but are you sending them anger? Are you distributing it to them? You know, so that they know, so that, but then at the end of the day, you go, no, no, I wasn't angry. They just asked me if I would do it, and I said yes. Did you say it like that? Or did you like, fine, and roll your eyes? <laughs> so these are, these are the things. As, and we can see this too in uh, parents and children, because this is, this, this does happen quite a bit. When you're raising children, and I, I have children, I know, it's, it gets frustrating sometimes. Or You can see people out in the shopping mall and they just snap because their kids maybe have been bugging them all day and they just bang at it and they discipline the child and then maybe when they come home they're like, well, 
I discipline the child for them. Did they have to know you can't act out in public, can't be doing that? But then when you look back, did you discipline your child for the sake of disciplining that child so that they would learn a lesson? Or are you mad at that child at that time and did you strike out in anger? Whether you hit them or not, maybe you yell at them. Is that, was it for the best interest of learning at that time, to learning not to behave that way? Or were you just fed up and you had it with them? <laughs> So these are interesting. These are interesting things to consider. But yeah, father, and mother, yeah, whip, whip or discipline a child. So that that's why I'm saying this one might not be as relevant to our society because I don't think it's not really socially acceptable anymore to corporally punish your children. I mean, some people do, and that's just some some people feel that's the way to discipline them. And it was used in the past, but it's just not as widely practiced these days. But that doesn't mean that we're still not disciplining our children out of anger rather than to try and actually teach them or correct them. Envy. So many strive for excellence in every aspect of their lives. Most people strive for the beautiful house, the new car, the prestigious career, and the great personal success. Almost always, always the best efforts of citizens have at their subconscious base envy. Envy is one that's e more easy for us to understand in our society because it is very materialistic, material-based. The acquisition of goods to us is somehow equated with happiness. So we know, we, we've probably all had a case where we've, we've felt envy. But there are other cases when we, we're not sure, we think we're doing things for one reason, but if we were to look a little deeper, we would understand that maybe it is envy that's driving me. Maybe I want to be like that person, or I want to have what that person has, or I want the praise that this co-worker has gotten, or whatever it is. So, and then, jealousy. Can I just ask? Sure, I've can. always been confused. Uh, envy is when we covet somebody else's possessions. We want what they have. Yeah. Is, that, is that it? Yeah. And jealousy is being jealous of the person. Yeah, they are similar, and there are some of these yeah. that, are, that are similar, like like gluttony and uh, laziness or sloth, they are pretty similar too. But yeah, like envy is to to see what see someone else's happiness and instead of being happy for them, want it for yourself. Which I guess jealousy could be like that also. But sometimes jealousy is more related to people who are close to us, like the people we love, like a spouse or like children or but they siblings. Are, yes. Yep. So they're jealous of that. Person. Yeah. Not the stuff they have. But right. The, okay, because right. that's always kind of. Yes. It, it kind of I thought that too. It does. Well, yeah. you could envy a person too because it's you envy yeah. their yeah. career, their yeah. success, their. So I don't know if they're yeah. very. It's not I believe that's why these two are placed together because they are yeah. very similar. And in some cases, I agree with you, like an interchangeable term. Yeah. Probably in the dictionary, they have those all in the same line. It's possible, yeah. Synonyms, right? Yeah. Envy yeah. and jealousy. Envy and jealousy. Uh, many people watch their spouses in an exaggerated way. Because these people are not outwardly violent or controlling, they claim to despise jealousy. They overlook their own jealousy to point out worse cases. So that's something we're talking about. I mean, sometimes in, in jealousy, it's almost like you want to be controlling of someone else's behavior. You want people to act a certain way so that it doesn't bring up certain emotions in you which is one way that would separate it from envy. <coughs> envy is where you just kind of want to emulate somebody or you really want what they have, right? Okay, so jealousy is also a uh, uh, control? Is it yeah, can, other people? yeah th this is some of the examples that uh, yeah, Samuel uh, was giving, but he was giving jealousy more as uh, examples to how spouses watch each other. But because they're not outwardly controlling of their spells, or because they, they don't tell their spouse, oh, you can't okay. do this, you can't do that, okay. then they feel, well, I don't have jealousy because I don't tell them okay. what to do. Okay, I see, yes. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some part that jealousy is acting through you in a more hidden, a more <coughs> subtle way. Yeah. Right? Like maybe. Passive. Right. Passive, you could be, yep, passive aggressive. Yeah. That's, you could do that. Yeah. Or, you know, like your spouse is saying, well, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out this weekend with the girls, you know, all right, yeah, 
Yeah, that's fine. I guess. You know, I understand you need time with the girls, but like, what are you guys doing? Like, it doesn't seem outwardly mean, but you, know, you can display these things without, yeah, like without it being so black and white, right? Yeah. And we all know, you know, like prying into into your spouse instead of being like, yes, fine, Tr being trust trustful or. Yeah. <laughs> Or the man could be like, I'm going out with the boys. <laughs> going out with the boys. <laughs> I'm going out with the boys, boys that out. And she's like, okay, fine, I'll just sit home alone without you. Like, is that controlling behavior? That's subtly controlling. Yes, trying to make you feel guilty. That's right. That's right. right. So, but because it, the, the people will say, well, no, I didn't stand up and be like, you cannot go out with your girlfriends tonight because I think you should stay home and watch the kids. The thing, because I wasn't blatant and ignorant and straightforward about it, that it's not jealousy. Yeah. But these things come in subtle forms. And that's what makes them difficult. That's when it's the most difficult is to say, okay, well, we have to watch the subtle forms of this. So what are you, you supposed to do? Like, you're supposed to acknowledge that you feel that way, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And observe that feeling in you and question. And do you tell the person that this is how I'm feeling or something? Get it out in the open, or <laughs> you can. Or you just—it's more like self-observing. You right you should do self-observing. I mean, the, I guess the idea would be to, to try and catch yourself to see if, well, where is this coming? Is this coming from a controlling okay. place because I don't want them to be doing something, or am I am I actually just interested to know where they're going? You know, mm -hmm. There's, we or have it to. Could be jealousy too. Like if you're if you're married and you're a wife, then. All your friends are going clubbing on Friday night, and you have to stay home with the right. kids. Right. Yeah. Because your husband's working. Sure. And so that could be jealousy, oh, not yes. because you care what friends, they're doing. Yeah. 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 Just that but you're, you wish you were doing it too. Yeah. 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 Jealousy, envy. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It comes in many forms. And but that would be more envy, wouldn't it? Like yeah. wishing envy. you were doing what they were doing. Be, sure. Yeah. Be like that sure. kind of envy. envy. Yeah. You know. I think jealousy would be stronger. I think. Yep. You know, it's like, it's one of these things that we're More trying personal. to say, stop being jealous and stop being angry. It's just, we're not, we're not saying that. Like, this is very difficult. What we're trying to say is to observe where your reactions are yeah. coming from. To observe where your reactions are coming from. So you know what's moving you. What external forces are making you do the things you do. So that if there's some kind of mechanical reaction, and maybe this is causing some kind of friction in your life, you now have the ability yourself to change it. Wouldn't it be more internal forces that are yeah internal or external like if yeah. yeah internal external whatever the forces are that yeah. are it, it might be controlling you beneficial for us to to know what they are so we can say oh, yeah. well it, is my whole life is it like a circumstance and then my reaction to a circumstance and if, right. and all the circumstance is always going to say is always going to dictate what my reaction is going to be then that is a little bit mechanical isn't it yeah. and it's like you have option A, B, or C, and depending on event A, B, or C, you're going to exhibit that. So are you really in control then, or is your, are your surroundings in control of you? That's right. These are just some of the questions that we're trying to think about. We're trying to observe ourselves to, to see if we want to change certain aspects of our lives or our, our, our situation. We can do that, but first we have to understand what those aspects are, or what the situation is, what's controlling us, and how we can affect a change. So we'll move on to laziness. That I know. <laughs> yeah, everyone does. This is this is one of the biggest obstacles to not just gnosis, but to anything that we set out to do. Laziness. This is a disease we have. It's called the disease of tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not tomorrow? There's always a tomorrow, but it's here's there's always yeah, a tomorrow, but it never actually comes, does it? <laughs> but it's always there for us to lean on. Well today is not quite good because I got this and this, but tomorrow will be better. The circumstances to do that will be better tomorrow, I'm sure of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like yeah. when people want to quit smoking, you know? Yeah. Or, or go on a diet or, or whatever. Oh. Yeah, oh, and this hides itself in many ways, yeah. Like, I want to go on a diet. So what am I... You, want, you, can't, you can't start a diet on a Wednesday night. You can't do it. No. I'm going to start it on Sunday morning. And yeah. now you put it off, and then Sunday morning comes around, do you start it? Well, I'm not going to meditate Sunday. tonight. I'm going to put it because, you know, I'm going to wait. I'm going to get my... Mind in a good place. I'm gonna start meditating. 
20 minutes a night starting starting tomorrow because I, mean, I got the my bedroom's a little messy. I gotta clean the bedroom before I <laughs> meditate. You gotta meditate in a clean space. Like these are these are subtle forms of what can we call laziness or distraction, yeah. right? Procrastination. Yeah. Right. Putting it off. Procrastination is the same as laziness, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. The accomplishment's the same. I don't feel like doing yeah. it today, yeah. if you're saying yeah. it. I'll, I'll see if I feel like it tomorrow. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but the circumstances weren't right for you to do the thing today, and then you do nothing to change those circumstances or understand the circumstances, then you can pretty much predict the future because if they're not right today and you do nothing to change them, they won't be right tomorrow or the next day or the next day, yeah. right? So many people in pseudo-esoteric schools despise the things of this world. There's a lot of people who say that the world is an illusion and they want to withdraw from and go to the Himalayas or whatever it is. They do not work at all because they claim that all is vanity. In this way, they cultivate laziness in the name of spirituality. So this is from... Samuel L. Ward's book, and it was very interesting because this is sometimes people have a want to do this to hide themselves from the world because they want to become spiritual, but it's hard. It'd be like hiding in a cave, right? Like to say, oh, the world is an illusion. I'm not going to take part in it because I want to raise spirituality. So I go and hide in a cave, and therefore none of these egos manifest through me because no one's around me to make me angry. And say you're in a cave for 10 years and You've never manifested anger or, or any bad thing. And then you come out of that cave and you go right back into society again. And then you'll soon discover that you didn't eliminate these, these egos. They were still there. They just, the circumstance wasn't there for them to present themselves. You go back into society and the first person who cuts you off, you get mad again. So, there, there is a, you, you can cultivate laziness in the name of spirituality. That's what saying. Gluttony. Many people who claim to despise gluttony eat more than normal, especially in this Western society where we enjoy a good appetite. People point to the obese as being gluttonous while overlooking their own gluttony because it seems less apparent outwardly. So that's true, even though you don't have to be extremely large to have gluttony. And it comes in different forms too, like People out of the bars getting drunk, if that's a form of gluttony, and wanting more than their share of alcohol or anything else, right? So gluttony, gluttony is kind of a difficult one because in our society it is more accepted and there's more availability for like, especially food-wise and everything else, but it's one of those capital sins to not take more than your share and try and understand what what those consequences are. Why are you taking more than your share or more than you need? Is it, because usually if you're taking more than you need, it's for a different reason. Either it's for your enjoyment or there's something else that's driving you. Pleasure, so maybe you're not happy with something, so you seek pleasure in something else like food or alcohol or drugs and you take vast amounts of those or more than your share anyways. So, in that way, Addiction can sometimes be seen as a form of gluttony, or maybe that's how it started, and then before it became an actual addiction. This is how, how some of these manifest. Pride. Many people who claim to despise flattery and praise have no problem humiliating with their modesty the one who gives them compliments. So this is, we think we're doing the exact opposite. We think we're not being pride because someone's telling us, Oh, oh yeah, you really did. No, 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 stop! Don't, don't lie. That's enough. Like, it, it's a form of pride in itself. <laughs> and I've found this too. Like working in the trades, sometimes you'll want to do this, and you'll you'll feel like you're helping someone out because you'll do something for them, and then they'll say, "Well, how much do I owe you for that?" And you're like, "No, it's okay." And then you'll find out that they actually will get insulted if you don't take their money. Right, because then it's kind of like, oh no, no, it's okay. You know, I'm doing it. I'll, I'll make this sacrifice for you, and I'll help you. And they want to pay you, but you're not giving them that opportunity. So, greed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, greed. Yep. Yeah. This is one of the one of the ones that's more prevalent even in our society today, and even amongst. We can see we can see this outwardly. Uh, in like major corporations or governments, oh, instant we can, and we can observe it very easily. Oh, yeah. everything's run by greed and this, but sometimes it's a little harder for us to accept that, that how we manifest 
the greed. But it's very easy to catch it in, in other people, especially these big corporations. Oh, they're money hungry and then this and that. But sometimes, you know, the, out, the outward society is a reflection of the internal. So we have to see what is it we don't like about the external society. Do I carry those elements within myself and then eliminate them? So, like, the society we live in can be a, a mirror for our internal condition. So many people cultivate greed under the guise of providing for themselves mansions, luxury cars, suites, sort of suites. Many claim that, uh, many claim they are just trying to give their families a better life. Workaholics, materialistic. Uh, by hiding behind the provider mask, they cultivate greed. Okay, so this is one that usually, usually we, we've known someone like this who their parents were a workaholic or maybe our parents were a workaholic and they always said that I just didn't, I didn't have a great life so I'm doing my best to provide for you and give you everything you want so you don't have to go without and you don't have to experience what I experienced from but maybe that person instead of having all these things maybe they just wanted more time with their parent, right? So this is possible and we can start to lie to ourselves about Oh, now we have to work overtime because I gotta get my kid this new pair of Nike shoes that all the other kids are wearing or whatever it is and maybe we could better spend our time by spending time with the kids themselves. So basically, I'm trying to look at these as these are some of the, the, the issues we face when we're trying to, to do the inner work. We have to say these things come in many forms and they many levels of severity and we think that well, if it's not, we're not outwardly manifesting it in a very blatant way, then we don't really have it at that moment. But sometimes the sometimes the whole war is a bunch of very tiny battles. <laughs> you see, lust. This is a difficult one as well. Uh, many people claim to despise lust because they are in a committed, uh, monogamous relationship. These same people were, will view their particular partner as a means to an end sexually. They fulfill their partner's needs with the fulfillment of their own needs in mind. Ulterior motives. This relationship is a glorified form of lust, although it does not appear so outwardly. If their partner did not fulfill their needs, they would inevitably move on. This, is of, course, this of course, is not love, but lust. So lust, lust in our side, it, it is a tricky one because it manifests in many, many forms, many forms. Like maybe the, the, the cute young secretary gets promoted faster or whatever because of, of lust or, I mean, advertisers know this. That's why you can't watch a commercial that doesn't have some kind of sexual reference in it or some kind of uh, display of sexuality to sell cheeseburgers or whatever, whatever it is. They, they, they use it. They know that lust is a strong one in us. That it's a strong uh, driving force, a motivator. And they've, it, like in advertising especially, they've done studies. They've spent lots of money to, to know what kind of images and what moves us. And they found that, that lust is one of the big ones. So you can't even see a commercial for a Pepsi Cola or whatever it is, but no, it's a supermodel drinking it or... A, <laughs> and sometimes we look at it and we're laughing. It's so vain. Like why? Why is? But it's because it's because we fall for it, and it's what interests us, I guess. I so, like those eyeglass commercials. Have you seen them? Right. There's the naughty librarian, and then there's oh, the yeah. other one where he's uh, sure. I don't, something about the casino and yeah. know, getting out of jail and. Yep. <laughs> oh. Yep. Get these eyeglasses and you'll be instantaneously this, sexually this, this attractive is, to them. I think she'll buy it. Yeah. 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 They're, they're funny. I like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anybody else get a hold of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's just something we need to be need to be aware of. Something out there working against us, and we oftentimes, many people, all of us, we confuse love and lust very easily. We've, but there's a difference, and it's. Pretty much up to us to understand what is the difference. Is it because I'm in a particular, I have a particular mood right now, so now I, I'm going to say, no, I'm in love with you, and I, and then, and the next week maybe that person isn't so. We thought they were the wonderfulest person in the world, and now 
Now what's happened? <laughs> now we've changed. Were we were we in love with them? Were we really in love, or was it was it fleeting lust that was masquerading as love? <laughs> lust is a, it's a difficult one for sure. So the rhetoric of the ego, it's empty rhetoric, and rhetoric. It's not my fault. I need why me me. Rhetoric is like the speech, the convincing speak, speaking, the words of the, of the ego. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric of the ego is the art of speaking well, in such a subtle way that we do not realize at which moment we have fallen into error. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the rhetoric of the ego is so subliminal that our consciousness sleeps without us ever realizing it. Each small ego that constitutes, or each small eye that constitutes our beloved ego, really has its own personal criteria, its own projects, its own ideas, and its own rhetoric. Rhetoric of the ego leads to fascination with the marvels. This is a quote from Samuel Moore, uh, with the marvels of the Antichrist, which is what he calls materialistic science, and the good-for-nothing materialistic psychology. The rhetoric of the ego leads to fascination. So this is interesting because in our, in our own way, we know how easy it is to convince ourselves, like we're saying, that if you want to do something particular, it's so easy to talk ourselves out of it or find so many reasons and we think, well, it's not really an ego. It's I actually have other stuff I have to do, right? But this, this is one uh, point that I always thought was interesting. The small eye constitutes, really has its own personal criteria, its own project, its own ideas, and its own rhetoric. We can verify this in our own lives because sometimes we'll be like, you know, I gotta, I really want to put a lot of energy, I want to, I want to learn the guitar, and then you'll just put so much energy into learning the guitar, and then a week goes by, and you're not interested in it anymore. Why? Is it because this was one, this is one mindset, you can even say, one ego of, of learning the guitar and trying to, to play it, and and then you put yourself in that mind frame of someone who is a guitar player and you act as though you are a guitar player and then, then it's replaced by another eye, another set of actions, another archetype. So. Mm -hmm. uh, rhetoric of the ego, and we're going to look at resistance. Resistance is the opposing force. It is the secret weapon of the ego. It is the psychic force of the ego that is opposed to us becoming conscious of all our psychological defects. The Gnostic path is a positive force. Every positive force is opposed by a negative force. Whenever we propose to carry out a certain action, whether it be annihilating an ego, controlling sexual energy, doing a certain work, we must observe and calculate the force of resistance. This is one of those, those laws that if you, like the law of the pendulum, remember you push so far in one direction, it's going to push back in the equal opposite direction. So we want to exert a, for, a force to, uh, to a specific end. There's going to be a, a specific calculatable force trying to stop us from reaching that end. Right? Like once again, you can use the idea of quitting smoking. There's a, there's a, people want to quit smoking a lot, but there's a huge force working against them so they don't quit smoking. The same as with meditating or trying to work on the path. If you want to work on yourself, you have to put force in, into it. You have to put conscious effort, voluntary suffering. But there's a force pushing against you that says, I don't know, I mean, it would be easier if I didn't do this. And it, and it comes in subtle forms. It's not like we can actually feel it pushing against us, but there's, there is a force that if you want it, with, if you have a certain amount of energy invested in a thing, that same certain amount of energy is going of the opposing side can be pushing against you to try and uh, make sure that you don't reach those goals that you set. The law of entropy is also this is the law of entropy is one of those forces of resistance. <clears throat> so the world and its me uh, mechanicity tends to provoke resistance because well like this being on this path it, it isn't easy and it's easier to be more swept along with life than it is to try and force yourself against it. So due to resistance, dreams become difficult to interpret and the knowledge of the self becomes clouded. 
Uh, resistance acts upon a defense mechanism which tries to omit unpleasant psychological errors so as not to have consciousness of them. We do this all the time. We, we try to omit, even on a subconscious level, it'll, we omit uh, these negative aspects of ourselves because we only see ourselves in one light. We, we see ourselves usually in the best light absolutely possible. And if there was an argument, we would always, we would always, even looking back, we would say, no, I was totally in the right. Even if we weren't, if we weren't in the right in the argument, we would find some justification why at the time we were right. Even though it might not have been right for us to react that way, we did because of this and that and this and that. <laughs> so the more gigantic the work, the greater the resistance will be. If we learn to calculate the resistance, we will be able to develop with success. So this is, this is one of the tricks. We have to be able to calculate the resistance that we're working against us. How do we do that? There are specific mechanisms to overcome resistance. First, we have to recognize. We have to recognize that there's going to be, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be resistance that's going to manifest itself to try and, try and make it difficult for us to accomplish the certain tasks we wish to accomplish. We have to define it. Well, what are those resistances? What are those that are stopping me? Why is it when I want to meditate and all of a sudden I sit down, but then my mind goes wild and I say, no, I left the stove on, even though you know you didn't have the stove on that day or whatever. We have to define, we have to figure out what those resistances are in our life. Oh, I can't. I mean, there's other people here and they're going to think I'm strange if I do this or if they, whatever it is. Three, we have to comprehend it. We have to sit down and say, well, why is it every time I sit down and meditate, and my mind goes wild and I, I start coming up with all these ideas that I know aren't really the case. Like, I know I didn't have the stove on. Why does my mind say, oh, got to shut the stove off? Or why do I feel an urgency that something else immediately has to be accomplished? Like, well, okay, I'll meditate. But no, i got to do the laundry because of this and that. We have to comprehend it. Is it, is it really, is it, is it that dire that we do these things at, at the time? Or is this, is this is actually a tool of resistance so that we don't carry out our intended goal? Uh, number four is we work on it, <laughs> which I know it's like that's easy, just work on it, <laughs> but it'd be like saying, well, when you sit down to meditate, I'm just using this as an example, when you sit down to meditate and your mind starts going wild, well, observe it. Well, what are these thoughts that are coming in? Do I have to go do any of this right now? No. Move past it and continue on doing what it is you set yourself to do at that specific time to work on it. This one is more advanced. It's a book. To overcome and disintegrate it by the means of the uh, sexual superdynamics or with the work of the uh, transmutation of the creative energies or the alchemical work with the partner. So the ego will battle fiercely against the analysis of the resistance so that its fallacies are not discovered. So the ego doesn't want to be discovered. And it'll say, it'll, it'll start to be like, <laughs> Well, what are you doing right now? I'm trying to tell you that, that you don't know how your own mind operates? Well, I'm in your mind, and you know how I operate. And there's, there's all these things like this. The battle fiercely against the analysis of resistance. During the battle, one must appeal to that power which is beyond the mind. The Divine Mother, Kundalini. This is why we say we can go, we can go very far. And at the beginning, we, we need prayer and devotion to help us, to get us through the tougher times, to help us to understand the things that we don't understand, to comprehend why this is so difficult for us, or to even just give us general assistance in the, the practices. Now we're going to talk about defeatism. Defeatism is the thoughts that prevent people from elevating their mechanical life to superior states. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> the intellectual animal, mistakenly called human, has the fixed idea that the annihilation of the ego, the absolute dominion of sex, and the inner self-realization of the being is something fantastic and impossible. Defeatism is deciding you can't do it before you've even started or before you've even attempted to try. So the majority of people consider themselves defeated even before beginning the struggle or Gnostic esoteric work. 
We must comprehend the ego of defeatism and all that makes it up. So defeatism is a big one. Because we come here and we hear all these classes and all these things and get a lot of information thrown at us and we say, well, it's, it's, stuff's interesting and I'm definitely interested in it, but it's, it's too hard for me. I'm not the person who can, the kind of person who can carry it out. This is defeatism. Right? To, 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 to say, it's possible, it's, it's not something that can be done <laughs> before it's even attempted. Oh, I can't, I can't have a deep meditation experience. I can't astral project. I, I just can't, because I know that. Yeah? But could it also be a, a masking uh, uh, laziness? It can be. It can also be fear of, of fear. things that are That's unknown right. to you. Right? But, but a lot of the, like, one of the facts is that if something isn't easy, we generally don't do it or we won't stick to it for like that's just humanity in general or society maybe that and we're saying no this work isn't impossible it's just it's just not it's not extremely easy it's not easy it doesn't make it impossible it means that there's an effort that has to be put in right and um, to consider yourself defeated before you even try well I mean, it's not even with this work, but we do it all the time, yeah. I heard a quote recently that, that really uh, brings that defeatism into light. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, let me remember it here. It's, you only get smart by facing a smarter <laughs> opponent. <laughs> That's right, yep. Sure, exactly. If you do what's easy... You know, that's what we do. We, we, yeah. we tend to do what's easy. We tend to be moved along and someone says, no, you can you can understand what's motivating you. You just have to observe yourself. Observe yourself? How do you do that? That's too hard. That's not for me. It's, in, it's impossible. No one, no one can do that. I mean, maybe that's true, but wouldn't you want to find out? You know, like, like the, the, defeatism is a, is a big one. Defeatism and laziness are big ones. Defeatism, it's a big one, but only until we start start to work, until we start meditating regularly, until we start, because then we will start to verify things, we will start to understand things, when we start to self-absorb. But sometimes we have to battle against it at the beginning, we have to be like, I remember very clearly like doing this, like, okay, I'm at work, I'm going to observe myself working, like and just doing it, and that some part of me feeling it it to be a little bit ridiculous or not even understanding exactly why and then it's like it's like practice fame. The more you do it, the more you realize, oh wait, this there is something to this. There is something to this. The way I'm acting, the things I'm saying, the things I'm doing, they're affecting my circumstances in life. It's not this outside thing that I just have to accept and that, oh I don't know why this always happens to me. Or it's like, well what are you doing? What am I doing that's it's causing this. Defeatism is one that we should work against, especially in the early. Because we're telling you, there's many people who will tell you that what, like what we're saying has been verified for them, and they've made it work for them, and meditation is important, and actual projection, and real people will say this, it's more important to verify it for themselves. So it's not impossible. Even if you search actual projection on the internet, <laughs> billions of things come up, doesn't it? It's not just this group, it's not just anything like there, there are some fantastical phenomenons that we can partake in that we can verify for ourselves first all we have to do is realize that it's possible so I might have to put an effort in trying I might have to say maybe I can do it maybe I'll just start one step at a time and I won't just view it as the whole big overwhelming picture of the whole thing So, and since this, there exists three common defeatist attitudes. One, to feel handicapped due to lack of intellectual education. Two, to feel incapable of beginning the radical transformation. And three, to feel unpresented with the opportunity to change or triumph. These are the three common defeatist attitudes, the three most common. There are many defeatist attitudes. So we'll look at them individually. To feel handicapped due to a lack of intellectual education. Do not confuse intellectual education with wisdom. The great masters, Hermes, 
uh, Trismegistus, Paracelsus, Plato, Socrates, etc., etc., never attended universities. Each person indeed has his own master. The master is the being. The being is beyond the mind and false rationalism. So, to confuse intellectual education and wisdom is something we do all the time. Remember, we were talking about the different levels of the being one time? A little while ago, we were saying there's different levels of the inner being. Sometimes you have to raise the level of the being, your circumstances and what, what you're around, to be able to acquire more different wisdom. So just because people have PhDs or their doctors, they have schooling, doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same wisdom that we're talking about. And there are many people who accomplish many great things who don't have this intellectual education. Like we always use Albert Einstein as an example of that failed math or something like this. <laughs> right? So what was it then? Why, why was he able down the road then to understand such big concepts, such mathematical concepts? Number two, to feel incapable of beginning the radical transformation. The human robots who are programmed by materialistic science feel that they are at a disadvantage because they feel they are not capable enough. The influence of our false academic education adulterates the value of the being, or it doesn't even take into consideration the value of the being. This ego must be eliminated because it causes laziness in the work and an aversion to the Gnostic path. The Gnostic path must be started here and now. It's kind of motivational. We can do it. <laughs> Start now. <laughs> right? So, we feel, this is, this is what we were talking about before with the fetus, and we feel we can't do it before we've even, even started. We're, we're just not capable of the radical transformation that they're talking about. It's just, maybe it's for other people, but for me, I'm just maybe maybe my next life maybe I'll do it I don't maybe this is just a, maybe the precursor maybe you know what I mean but can't wait for the future we can't wait for our next life we can't wait because we never we're never positive of these outcomes we're positive of the the next life so three to feel unpresented with the opportunity to change or triumph. Everything is the result of a law of action and consequence. However, the possibility that a superior law transcends an inferior law exists. We must fabricate in the moment the opportune moments for spiritual growth. So that's a fancy way of saying we must use our everyday experiences, our everyday life for spiritual growth. Right? Not to wait for the perfect conditions to be there. Not to wait. Well, it'll be easier to self-observe at some other time. Oh, we can use this moment right now. When we're sitting in the, and, and we're sitting here in this basement. We're listening to this lecture. However, we feel. You know what I mean? Like the, oper the the moment is now. We're not waiting for some future moment. So it is not the quantity of theories that matters, but the quantity of super efforts that are exerted in the work of the revolution of the consciousness. So. What we're trying to say is it's not all about inte acquiring intellectual knowledge. It's more about practical knowledge, doing the practices. Uh, the scenes of existence can be modified. One creates his own circumstances. Right? If we're not controlled by the ego, or if we observe the ego manifesting through ourselves, and then we don't let it, manifest through ourselves or we understand before it takes hold of us then instead of lashing out in anger and then feeling guilty about it later or oh, I shouldn't have done that now maybe we could change that circumstance we can observe ourselves and say no this is ego this is an ego trying to work through me this is how it's making me feel and maybe this isn't the best reaction to this to this scenario to this circumstance and that way we can start to place the consciousness between our reaction and the external circumstance that is causing that reaction. So rhetoric of the ego, psychological slavery. Psychological slavery is a psychological dependence on someone else. Psychological slavery destroys interaction. If our thoughts, feelings, and action are dependent upon those of the people we interact with, then we are enslaved. 
We are not free if, we, if our conduct depends on the conduct of others. We're not truly free if we say, well, I'm really good at working on my ego of anger as long as no one's there making me angry. Right? Because that's more, that's not exactly what we're talking about. If we, oh, there we go. <laughs> if we wish to eliminate anger but demand that people we interact with treat us sweetly and serenely, people are not saints. And if your conduct depends on theirs, you will surely fail. Because this is not a work on others. This is not making sure that everyone treats you the way that you think you should be treated. This is a work on yourself to make sure that you understand your reactions to certain circumstances. So our conduct must be our own. It must not depend on anyone. Our thoughts, feelings, and actions must flow from the inside to the outside. So this is, one of the, this is the goal that we're working on, that our conduct, our reactions are our own, that someone isn't controlling us. Because that's, that's what happens, right? If, if, if someone, someone praises you, and they're making you feel happy and good, then they, will, they have the power to make you feel, feel good. They also have the power to make you feel bad. So depending on what you hear from someone else is going to dictate your feeling. Mm -hmm. Plus, not only that, if we have a negative scene or a, a negative event in life where a family member gets mad at us for no reason or whatever, then... We storm around, we get mad, we're mad with that family member maybe for a day or a week or a month or maybe. So how long has that one, one circumstance controlled our emotions and our feelings, made us act a certain way? So these are things that we, we, can, we can kind of comprehend, right? It's like, I mean, we understand that it's not nice. It's, it's not nice when people... Yeah, well, that's we're not saying that, you know, when people yell at you, you should just sit there serenely like one of those Buddhist statues. We're just saying that maybe you shouldn't, you shouldn't... Lash out. Shouldn't, you shouldn't, or lash out, or you shouldn't let it... Identify with. Right? Or maybe there's reason, maybe this person, maybe they themselves have had a really bad day, and now they're taking it on you, and maybe we can relate to that a little bit, because one time we had a bad day, and then our wife said hello to us and we said ah, I can't deal with it right now and we've lashed out on someone else so we understand what it's like. It's not saying that we just sit there and get abused and whatever but it's just more understanding towards people. But the more, the, the deeper reason why we do this is, is so that we don't let these external circumstances control us so much. Right? So, some, so anyone can have a bad day, and anyone can lash out at somebody, but if that happens to you, this is just an example, but it, there's many. Like, do you want to let that ruin, say, the rest of your day? Or maybe you were going to go out that, that night for supper with a loved one, and now, you, now your supper's going to be ruined because on your mind you just keep replaying the scene that happened earlier? How much of your, your energy in your life are you going to allow to be stolen by one event that maybe that person didn't even realize? Maybe they were having a bad day themselves, and they were just dismissive of you and were very hurt by it, or whatever. So this is, this is, I mean, as much as it is to try and understand our fellow man, it's also just to help to free ourselves a little bit. Right? Because we don't, we don't want to be controlled by others. We don't want to be dependent on others for our happiness. There's, there's many people out there like that. And, you know, and all of a sudden this person, your significant other, has to go away for a while, and now you're what do I do with myself, and I'm sad, and I'm only, I'm only happy when you're around, or whatever it is. So this is, these are things that, they're very mundane. They're very mundane examples and ideas, but we can see them. We can kind of understand them, and we can start to realize maybe there is something to observing the egos. Maybe, maybe there is something to it. Maybe, maybe it's something that would be beneficial for us. So rhetoric of the ego, transactions. Transactions. What we are in this world is the direct result of our own mental processes. This is something you kind of hear in like occultists and Samuel occultists and all those new ages. We are the result of our own mental processes, all right. Well, 97% of human thoughts are negative and harmful. Introversion and psychological self-exploration becomes very difficult due to the force of counter-transference. Counter-transference.
transference is the force that automatically and mechanically forces our attention to the stimulus of the outside world. It's very easy for us to observe what's going on externally and very difficult for us to observe what's going on internally. Right? Because this is before us, this is what we're viewing, this is the thing that's at hand. But it's something different to try and for us to observe how that, uh, what, what that's uh, allowing to occur inside of us or internal. How, we're, how are we feeling about that right now, right? It's way more easy just to have our, our focus on the external world. So, attention must be consciously transferred inwards in order to explore oneself and to know oneself. Great practice in meditation and self-observation will lead to the overcoming of the force of counter-transference. So, the meditation and self-observation, they, they help a lot because they are internal practices, right? They're practices that help you to go internal so that you're not just always focus on what's outside, what, what the scenario is, what's happening to you, but you're also now starting to be more aware of what your reaction is and your consequences to that circumstances are. <clears throat> Deformation of the word. The Gnostic student who follows the path of the revolution of the consciousness must become accustomed to controlling the tongue. It is not what enters the mouth that causes harm, but rather what comes forth from it. Words filled with bad intentions produce fornications in the world of the mind. One not only hurts others with insults and artistic ironies, but also with the tone of voice. Oftentimes one hurts others with words in an unconscious manner. One must learn how to handle the verb. One must calculate with nobility the result of spoken words. Insulting and, harmon and harmonious words are as devastating as a cannonball smashing a pane of glass. However, a soft word can pacify a violent wrath. This is one thing that we never, we don't really think about too often. You know, the verb creates. Well, it can create, in, even when we're talking about in an everyday situation. Like the, the words that you say will affect that situation. Yes, yes, that's obvious. We understand that. But do we ever think before we like? That's one of the oldest things. Think before you speak. You know, your mother said it to you all the time, especially when you're in church or whatever. You know, you gotta think before you speak or when you talk, you're playing with your brothers. Sometimes we just we tend to just speak mechanically. We tend to not even put any any kind of effort into thinking about how our words will affect the others around us. It's one of those, uh, and if you've ever seen you know, the Az Aztec sunstone there on the stairway, if you notice the picture in the very center, he's biting his tongue. They said that is one of the biggest problems of this fifth race will ever have, is its inability to control its own verb, to understand the power that words have, to understand the power the words have on people around them. Right? Even the tone of voice has a power, what we were talking about earlier. touched on this one a bit last time, I believe, the exactness of the term. So in the path of the revolution of the consciousness, precision of the verb is foundational. Language is the instrument of individual expression and communication among humans. That's pretty obvious. The word is the exteriorization of our complicated interior language. The word can be utilized by either the being or the ego. When trying to solve a problem, we must abstain from expressing our opinion. This is one that I have in my daily life tried to put into action, and, and the results are, are very interesting. To try to solve a problem without stating your opinion. An opinion is the act of choosing one viewpoint while simultaneously affirming that the opposite viewpoint may in fact be correct. Opinions are not truth, and thus opinions can be debated. We must resolve a problem by meditating on it. We must choose our words carefully with precision in mind in order to communicate to others effectively. This, this is something difficult because all we, all we do is express our opinion. But This is one of those practices in uh, 
instead of being subjective about an event, to try and be objective about it, to try and see what it was. Player A, player B, player A says this, B says this, this is the outcome, without trying to actually attach our own personal opinions about, because maybe we have certain feelings about player A, so we're just not going to agree with them anyways. So maybe we have to look past this kind of thing to see, to see the actual event as it actually was. <laughs> Instead of just our take on it or our opinion about it. Uh, exactness of the term. Be it known to you that speaking in an improper manner is not only committing a fault in what is said, but also a type of damage which is caused to the souls. That was said by our main man, Plato. Because he also knew that words, how we speak, and the words we use are very important to understand. So, contumacy. Uh, contumacy is the insistence of pointing out errors. This can be a very positive tool in trying to observe and eliminate our own particular ego. However, it can also be a great obstacle if not applied correctly. The key is, we must seek the errors we perceive in others within our own selves. So, we perceive that this person has this or that wrong with them. We say, well, what is it that we think they're doing wrong? Or what do we think that they're manifesting? What is it, what is it the ego that we disagree with them manifesting? How do I manifest that ego? Because right, it's not really our job to, to point out other people's egos. It will get us nowhere. It will actually make people not like us. <laughs> right? We all know people like that. It'll be people's mothers or our mother-in-laws are like that, pointing out what you should be doing or... It's an individual work on ourselves. It's the difference between sanctity and sanctimoniousness. Sanctity is severe and sweet. Virtues are not seen as obstacles, but precious gems of the soul. Sincere and authentic, this is sanctity. And sanctimoniousness is when one becomes horrified with the actions of others. Just appalled, I would never do that, I don't know why either. <laughs> They're doing that. I can't even understand why they would ever do that. I would never do something like that. Like people who are vegetarians who are mad at meat eaters, or anti-smokers who get mad at smokers, or people who are just very into other people's business. And you could use that efforts, understanding things about your own self instead of judging what you perceive as problems in other people. If you think that eating meat is a horrible thing to do, then you should not eat meat because that's the decision you've made for you, but it's hard to try and guilt people into seeing your perspective and it will never really work. And this is why there's so many oppo opposing opinions out there. Everyone just really believes their opinion is correct and the other person's opinion is wrong. So will they ever be swayed by each other? No. <laughs> so this is the thing with opinion. It's just two opposite sides of an argument that no one will ever meet on the middle in. Self-esteem. Vanity is the living manifestation of self-esteem. Self-esteem is something terrible. This is what Samuel Moore said. The eye always enjoys the admiration of others. The eye believes itself to be good, just, beautiful, pure, and holy. No one believes they are evil. Self-esteem occurs because the eye loves itself too much. The self that is loved and esteemed is not the, not the being but the personality, the ego, the intellectual animal. So this is what we're saying. Is, so what are we supposed to Are we supposed to have low self-esteem? Is that what? No, yeah, that's, we're supposed to hate ourselves? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, because that's actually just the opposite of the exact same thing. That's right. It's still the same thing. It's still always worrying about ourselves and how we're perceived. And it's like, either we really love ourselves or we don't love ourselves enough because we're horrible. It's the same thing, really, if we look at it objectively. Negligence. I know, I, I remember when I went to this one too, I felt like this whole lecture was, this is a big bummer. Right? <laughs> like these are all the obstacles of the work. I remember thinking that too. But, well, it's because we're trying to point out obstacles, but it's just one of those lectures that you know, it's, it's important to understand because we have an aversion to trying to understand these obstacles and then we wonder why it is. Certainly, why have why, why I never experienced this or that? Or what is it about me why I can't 
do this or that, and this is just trying to make us aware of it. I'm really not meaning to bring everyone down. This is just <laughs> an important aspect. And then we'll get through it. Negligence is to not elect or to surrender to the arms of failure. Negligence is of the ego. The ego can neither elect nor distinguish. Only the being can. Negligence and carelessness lead every human being to failure. The opposite of negligence is intuition. Intuition is of the being. Okay, so here we have a bunch of negligence and intuition, that's basically. But negligence, we can kind of understand it through our society, because, you know, there's parents who get charged with child neglect. What, well, what is negligence? That's failing to do the thing that you should be doing, right? That, that's what child neglect is. Neglect, it's not saying that, oh, you know, you kind of just forgot to do, to take care of your child, you just forgot. No, you chose not to do what was required of you as a, as a parent, as an example. So negligence isn't just like forgetfulness, or like, it, it's actually choosing to do that which we know is opposite to what we should be doing. It's because the person was thinking more of themselves. Yeah. Knowing there, what's best for them. Yeah, there's lots of reasons why negligence, laziness can be a reason why negligence occurs. That's right. Or, yeah, being too wrapped up in your own self or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Depends so on the like case. Ill will, right? Yeah, it is exactly. It's like ill will. It's like doing something wrong, even though you know it's wrong, mm -hmm. which is kind of like doubly bad. Gregarious conduct. I do like saying that word, gregarious. <laughs> gregarious conduct is the tendency to ally oneself to another human, to other human machines, without distinction or control of any kind. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, really. I think that's that's how we do it. A really kind of confusing sentence, and then we'll try and explain it after. The intellectual animal acts very different in a crowd than when alone. Oh, yes. It's like mob mentality or the group yes. mentality. Mob mentality causes people to do things they would never do otherwise. Right? This is how riots in the street happen. Like, mm -hmm. What was that one in Vancouver because the hockey team Stanley lost Cup. the Stanley Cup? Mm -hmm. and there was a riot. I think those people would, would have done that. Like, would they go up, you know, would they say, you know what, I want to do today. I know there's not a lot of people in the street, but I would really like to burn a police car or I would like to smash a window. They, they do things that they would never have normally done unless they weren't in this group setting, feeding off of the group energy, the group mentality, and just letting themselves be carried away with that. Riots, vandalism, violence, looting, etc. We must select our emotions carefully. Do not open the doors to a drunkard or you invite drunkenness. Do not open the doors to promiscuous advances from opposite sex or you invite fornication. We must shut the doors to negative emotions. Drug addicts, murderers, thieves, etc. infect other people. We must open the doors of perception to positive emotions. Like we don't want we don't want to be carried away by group mentality. There's never really been a mob mentality where afterwards it said, you know, we were actually thinking of at our best and highest level and during that mob mentality scene <laughs> when we went <laughs> to the streets and we caused mayhem. That was just, that was a good moment for all of us. We came together. No, it's usually the opposite. Usually people are like, oh, I got caught up in the moment, right? I got caught up in all of my emotions got the best of me or whatever. But we have sayings to justify this kind of behavior like that. But no, we have to, we have to try and select our emotions carefully. It's easy, it's very easy for the emotions of others to become our emotions, right? When someone's really happy around you, it's easy to share in that happiness. Or when someone is really down and miserable, it's easy for you to be like, oh, why are you always miserable? And that's making me miserable. And it's easy for us to take on the emotions of other people. I know we do. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's chilly down here. Oh, Kalkian personality. A Kalkian personality. Another <laughs> fun word to say. Kalkian. Kalkian. We touched on it briefly in, the, uh, in one of the other lectures, but it'll, it'll refresh you. 
the Calcium personality is the outcome of the dissemination of morbid knowledge through pseudo-esoteric and pseudo-occult schools in the West. Oh. The Calcium personality is more like, like a new age, the mystical attitude that I'm very self-sufficient, I understand everything I have, you know, because they've read theories, many theories on spirituality or, or whatever it is. These schools are indefinite, vague, incoherent, and subjective. Calcium personalities are disrespectful and irreverent. They have lost both the sense of authentic devotion and the sense of true veneration for the ancient patriarchs. The Calcian personality is full of pedantries and intellectual theories. Like pedantries like book smarts and loving book smarts and using the book smarts to try to impress other people. This is people who, this is more like a spiritual, people who are in spirit, like spiritual path but they feel like they're already, they know everything because they read this author and that author and that author and this author. But the Chalcian personalities are victims of self-deceit. They fear the tantric mysteries. They believe they already possess the superior bodies. Mm -hmm. They disregard the need to eliminate ego. <clears throat> they are stuffed with theories which makes them feel self-sufficient. So... I'm not sure if anyone's ever attained self-knowledge or enlightenment, enlightenment by reading a book written by somebody else's perspective. So what we're trying to say is there's an internal process to know your own self. It's the most important thing. It does help to read. I'm not saying that you shouldn't read or anything, but just that, that intellectual knowledge and wisdom are two diff different things. Wisdom is, comes from direct experience. So... Uh, we, the Gnostics, do not march in the path of all those little schools which are created by the Colchian personalities. The true schools of the White Lodge always preach the three factors. Birth of the solar bodies. What's the number two going to be? <laughs> death. 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 <laughs> death of the ego. ego. And sacrifice for humanity. humanity. You guys are getting it. <laughs> <laughs> the fallacy of the ego. Yeah. They do with a bunch of other egos in him. The fallacy of the ego is the habit of deceiving without any limitations. This fallacy is produced through the series of the eye. The eye processes itself in series, in more series of thoughts, sentiments, desires, hatreds, habits, etc. Due to the fallacy of the ego, most people hide their perversities while they smile like saints. We all carry the Pharisee within us. We are very beautiful from the outside, but we are very rotten on the inside. This is a quote. Oh, these words are strong, but it's, it's to drive a point home. Trying to make you feel bad. We conceal our perversities from the eyes of others, but we also conceal them from ourselves. The ego hides itself within itself. So this is true that we do we, we do conceal our perversities from the eyes of others or we, we conceal our defects from others. Mm -hmm. We don't want people to see us in a certain light. But on an even deeper level, we do that internally to ourselves. We deceive ourselves. We also don't see ourselves. We also refuse to see ourselves in a certain light. It is only in the stillness of the mind that we see the eye just as it is. The stillness of the ocean of the mind is not a result. It is a natural state. So this is kind of going back what he said to the ego being a knot in the, the ocean of life. That, that the still, serene mind isn't a result. It's a natural state. The swollen waves of thoughts are only an accident produced by a monster, the ego. The inability to control our mind, to have a serene mind, would, would be what we consider the natural state, saying, oh, it's the opposite. This is, this is the opposite. Upon the pure waters of the mind, we can contemplate all the deviltries of the ego. 
When the e ego can no longer hide, it is condemned to death. This is why it's important to meditate, because this is where we can truly see the ego for what it is. The stillness of the mind. <coughs> Fallacy of the ego. Blind Pharisee, first make clean the inside of the cup, that the outside thereof may become clean. This is a quote from the New Testament that Jesus said. First you must clean the internal, and then the external will be clean. This is kind of what we're talking about too, about sanctity and sanctimoniousness. This is the man donating his money to the church in front of the window so that all can see him, how good of a person he is, how much he's donating. And this is the poor man who's donating what he can from the shadows without being seen, without wanting the praise of being good or, or for people to see how charitable he is. It's kind of it's one of those strong pictures. It's one of those stories from the Bible, but I do like it. Clean the inside of the cup that the outside thereof may become clean. That's exactly what he was talking about. Take care of our internal aspects. Eliminate the ego and then then be outwardly beautiful. Don't put on the mask of beautifulness to hide the inside. Jofra hanging up there on the wall too. <clears throat> Work with the three factors. Right. This is actually just a section of this painting, but it's a, with the work of what? Work with the three factors. Oh. So progress in the What's inner the work. Star? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the microcosm star. There's the serpent ascending there. Yeah. There's a lot of real esoteric imagery. Mm -hmm. So how do we work with the three factors? Cultivate a deep uneasiness or longing for your being. Maybe not even your being, maybe a longing to know or to understand what is truth. Cultivate a love for the work. If you start to meditate and you start to enjoy the time that you meditate, it's easier to meditate. If you, right. If, right? To cultivate a love for the work. To start to develop that continuity of purpose to say, Oh, today I'm going to try and observe my actions and use that as your anchor for the whole day. To, to make that your center focal point. To have a continuity of purpose. That means that you're living your day with an objective, with a goal. Prayer and devotion are, are a big one. Repentance, the door that's always open, is how we start to work with the three factors. Um, continual sacrifices and super efforts to move forward. Because there's going to be <laughs> times, and it happens to everybody, it doesn't matter if you're phase C or second chamber or you've been a member of Gnosis for 40 years, there's going to be times when you're going to be like, I don't want to do my practices today, I don't want to do them, I'm not in a good mood, and it's just, it'll be better tomorrow. Well, what, what, what's required then to move on? A super effort, to put in an extra effort, to say, all right, no, it's important that I do these, that I, I meditate, that I try to observe myself. These are important things to do. That's what we're talking about, super efforts. And the continual sacrifices. This isn't like you know, sitting in your bedroom and whipping yourself like a priest or a religious priest or whatever. This is sacrificing those things that you think you want to be doing. <laughs> sacrificing you know, watching television or sacrificing your Wednesday evening or whatever it may be. That is our slide on obstacles to the inner work.